Well, Brian, this is Brian Harrison, who had a very considerable influence on my life and career, and it's a great pleasure and privilege to have a chance to talk to you. I will start by asking when and where you were born. I was born in Hampstead, a bell-sized park, actually, in a flat... Well, my parents lived in Glenlock Court in um, bell-sized park. Uh, my father was a buyer in the toy department in Peter Robinson, which was then a London, Port London store. My mother had been in the hat department at... Uh, uh, well, she worked for McCracken and Bowen, who were hat makers, women's hat makers, in the Marylebone area. And um, it's quite interesting the way they met, because... <coughs> um, before my mother went to McCracken and Bowen, she worked as an assistant or something um, in Peter Robinson. And when she left, they organised a whip round to give her a leaving present. And my father contributed to that whip round. They bought her um, a silver container, which I still got upstairs, um, uh, containing visiting cards, in fact, or cards. And um, so she went round all to all the people who'd subscribed because there's a list and um, thanked them and uh, I am here uh, now because um, she thanked my father as the, <laughs> the buyer the buyer in the toy department so that's where they met and uh, my father was then still a buyer in Peter Robinson when they lived in Belsize Park my mother was a housewife, as was normal in those days. She didn't have any career by that time. Had a terrible time with me because I cried all the time, apparently, and she just ran away at one point. My, my father found her in the lift going down at Belsize Park because <laughs> she loved going to the West End of London and loved the shops there. And she just ran away from me. Uh, and uh, he was appalled. How old were you? Uh, I was then about two, probably, or one. He, no, probably mm. one. I was born in 1937, 9th of July 1937. And um, I just cried a lot. And mm. um, she couldn't stand it. And she had no... Uh, so you, you immediately go back because um, her mother died in the flu epidemic in the first, uh, at the end of the First World War. And her father died allegedly of a broken heart three three years after that, when she was about four or five, and um, so she never had a mother, really, and she always felt the need for a mother because you see a mother would just really stand in, at the, in that sort of situation would stand in and would have said, well look if the child's crying. Um, give it some, I don't know what, the equivalent of Godfrey's cordial or, or whatever to shut it up. <laughs> and um, so my mother had no mother to guide her and um, she was a absolutely at sea. And very fortunately, there was a charming woman, a North Country woman, very motherly, called Mrs. Blackstock. And Mrs. Blackstock took my mother in hand and uh, she said, well now, she had two children of her own, she said, well now, uh, you know, if this happens, do that, and so on. My father had all sorts. My father was a very interesting man in many ways. He had all sorts of theories, and one of them was that you don't do any washing up at the weekend. <laughs> so she found herself on Monday morning with this huge pile of washing up to be done, and Mrs. Blackstock helped her and said, "Well, you must get your husband in order." <laughs> you know, his theories uh, happily coincide with the fact that he wasn't around during the week. Yes, I mean, and he didn't really like her, you see, because she was suspicious of her. Mm. He was suspicious of her and her influence. Anyway, um, th this may have had a very important effect for, for me because my mother told me that um, her son Ewart, who was in the fire service, Mrs. Blackstock's son. You dropped me once when I was a baby on my head and um, my father was furious about it and never let you ever hold me again um, but uh, this may be responsible <laughs> for all <laughs> sorts of things <laughs> but I mean uh, the very first school report I had uh, um, or very early on I've got them all upstairs emphasized that I was, I, well, the phrase was that Miss Dowdish, the, the uh, prep, prep school head uh, mistress said, he positively revels in work. 
and uh, that's what I've always done and I've been very very happy in anything I've done um, because I just somehow I enjoy working I'm a workaholic and um, uh, so I've been very fortunate in being a profession where work actually accumulates in some sense and um, it uh, um, means that my life has a sort of harmony about it which most people's doesn't I think and no doubt yours is similar in this respect that there's no distinction for me and never has been between weekends and weekdays um, or um, between holidays and non-holidays I mean it's all harmonious it's all one and um, so I work on holiday and and I um, enjoy my work I mean uh, and that all goes way before school I mean it's, it's all started much earlier than that but of course I went uh, to to a, a good school because my mother was socially ambitious she viewed education as a way of moving up or at least avoiding moving down in socially my father uh, was very much in favor of education for the right reasons they just felt that people should realize their full potential anyway between them they reached the same conclusion that I should be sent to Alcuin House School which was the little prep school with probably not more than a hundred pupils something like that nothing like as grand as a dragon and um, I got a very good education there Miss Dalglish was um, very encouraging I was a very nervous child and I had a I had a, a term where I was completely off school altogether I mean I was how old were you? I was then about six or seven mm. and um, for some reason I was frightened of going to school I, I don't remember being bullied or anything but um, anyway they took me away from the school and, and I stayed at home and Miss Dalglish wrote a letter saying we're looking forward to seeing you come back next term and I did go back next term and it was all right after that but I, I was quite a nervous child really looking back and my parents were very good in trying to understand what the problems were and so on because I got very good school reports you see uh, and um, they had a really outrageous system when looking back now by present day standards because when you came top of the class you were given what was called a list and the list was of all the pupils in that class in, in rank order of performance and I, I kept on getting all the lists <laughs> <laughs> and you know used to at the, at the end of the term you used to go walk up to receive the, your list from the headmaster uh, and um, T. Darcy Yeo, his work his name was, and um, um, so I walked off with all the lists. <laughs> and uh, so my parents knew I was bright um, and did everything they could to encourage it, really, but for two quite different but complementary reasons. And uh, it's from that that school that got me to Merchant Taylor's School in Northwood. And uh, I, as I was saying, I think yesterday. Um, I, I was taught Latin there better. I, my, my performance at Latin peaked at age 13. Um, I never was taught at Merchant Taylor's Latin better than I learned it then. And it was all prepared for what was called the common entrance. No doubt you took it too, mm. I don't know. Anyway, that was the way you got into a public school. Then you took it at, you didn't do 11 plus or anything. You took it at 13 and you either got in or you didn't and uh, I got an exhibition. I didn't get a scholarship but I got an exhibition to Merchant Taylors which was I think something like £40 a year. It seems piddling some now but it helped and uh, my, my mother had a brother who was quite affluent and uh, he helped out I think a bit. Anyway, um, going back a bit now because I was talking about my mother it all, history really does go back because yes, please go back a bit yes I mean um, broadly speaking the situation was this that the Saville family and it's spelt without an E they're always very keen on that um, are the Shaw Saville shipping line that was uh, quite a big operation in the Edwardian period and they also were in brewing it was it was northeast London and um, they were also um, the estate agents mm. or um, Savills. land agents, Savills land agents. And um, my grandfather, Martin Savill, was um, the, the, they always regarded as the poor branch of the family. 
uh, and um, obviously when my grandfather, my grandmother died, and then very soon after my grandfather, I think it was drink, not broken heart, but the <laughs> two two aren't distinguishable. Um, when that they took an interest and really wanted to help, and there were, um, I think I'm trying to remember, there were six siblings. I think there was my aunt Margot. That's one. My mother. That's two. Gordon, who went to Australia, that's three. Jack, who went to Canada, that's four. Mary, who was badly crippled and stayed in England. And Geoffrey, does that make six? So that's all of them. Anyway, there were six of them. Two of them had already gone off to Australia and Canada. And they've both founded quite big clans in both, both colonies. Um, uh, the other four stayed in England, and as I say, Mary, Meredith, was very seriously crippled. He had rheumatoid arthritis, and um, like many crippled people in the family, he became the centre of the family, he united the family. He was a charming person, and very much loved by everybody. And, um, uh, but they had him on their hands, you see, they had to look after him. Two girls, Margot and my mother, who couldn't earn very much. The only one who earned anything. Oh, and Tom. I, there must have been seven. Seven. I'm sorry. Because there was Tom as well. Tom was young and he couldn't earn at that stage. And there was Geoffrey, who, who was apprenticed to a firm called C.A.V. C.A. Vanderbilt, who were an engineering firm in Ealing. And um, he was head of the family. So when the, both the mother and father were dead, and the, the, there was quite a lot of pressure from solicitors to um, uh, take over, uh, for, for the rich members of the Savile family to take over. But they wouldn't have any of it. They wanted to remain independent, and they were terrified of being broken up. So they stayed together. I mean, the, the, the two went off to the colonies, and the other five stayed together, including my mother. My mother always used to say she had an extremely happy childhood. But she was brought up by her brothers, you see, and, and by her elder sister. And so she never had a mother to guide her through the business of being a woman, really. Mm. Uh, I always felt, I always thought, should I ever appear on the scene? She didn't know anything about sex, you know, like a lot of women, I suppose, at that time. And sex was not something one could easily talk about to her. Um, but somehow I was conceived. <laughs> and... Um, um, but she was remained very innocent in all sorts of ways and she never really I think she was sort of in love with my father I don't really know but um, she she gave misleading signals to men so that they thought she was fond of them when really she was just trying to be nice to them mm -hmm. and it led to all sorts of misunderstandings particularly when she separated from my father she always said that the difference in their age didn't matter my father was about 20 years older than she was um, but she always said it didn't matter that wasn't the cause of the dispute the cause of the dispute was that he was unreliable about money so people used to when I was a teenager, people used to lock at the door and uh, say, we haven't been paid, our bill hasn't been paid. And my mother was quite terrified by that because her brothers had always paid their bills. So she didn't know where she was. And um, eventually they separated, but um, that was only when I came back from the army after natural service and um, it didn't have any traumatic effects. But I remember them arguing when I was a teenager it, downstairs. They thought I was asleep, but I wasn't. They, they, they had quite fierce arguments and my mother used to burst into tears and my father used to get rather loud and my mother used to say, don't shout. <laughs> you wake and, the boy. <laughs> and, um, uh, it's curious how children react. You can't predict. Um, people would now say, well, this is lethal, you know. Mm. It wasn't at all. It was like a thunderstorm. I rather liked thunderstorms. Uh, it didn't worry me. It was just something that happened. Just like the pulling of the hair by the schoolmaster in the classroom. It was something, you know, this just happened. Um, so um, that was this was where they came from really um, uh, but do ask any questions yes um, just a little more about your their, their characters I've got something of your mother your father mm. apart from his theories about washing up mm. what else 
characterised him, him? Yes, well, it was difficult because, you see, my mother, um, when she was turning against my father, which she did, um, took me into consultation so that, and again, this is a fatal thing to do, yeah. but yeah. nonetheless, I was always rather flattered because she'd talk to me about all sorts of confidential things. I remember say, she saying... Um, you were the only child. Maybe. Yeah, I was the only child. Uh, she'd, she said, well, I'm thinking of moving into the front bedroom, which had been their shared big front mm. bedroom. And um, I usually agreed with her. Obviously, I was very fond of her. But um, I said, well, you can't do that. You can't push, push your husband into the back room. And what she did... Um, and uh, but you know she took me into consultation about that. Uh, she didn't take any notice of what I said. <laughs> um, but um, that happened quite a lot, and it had the effect of putting me against my father, um, which was a pity because I can't answer your question very easily now, much as I'd like to to be able to do so. He was a clever man, very clever. He was an accountant uh, by training and self made really he came his mother i don't know anything about my my uh, grandparents really my my mother used to under duress entertain her mother-in-law at home at christmas but very much under duress didn't like her at all um and i never went up to yorkshire where they lived my father came from hull but his father allegedly ran off somewhere to me. I was told to Canada uh, I, but I never found out I don't I never I don't I don't go any further back than that on that side mm. but I can go an awful long further long way further back on my mother's side mm. he was a clever man uh, he thought for himself in the Second World War he resigned or was sacked or whatever from Peter Robinson he set up on his own as a toy manufacturer in Percy Street just off Tottenham Court Road and I used to go there sometimes, and um, they made a great fuss of me because his employees were refugees. Uh, there was Miss Rosenzweig, was the um, uh, woman who ran the workshop, and you can imagine uh, what her religious background was. Mm. She was a refugee, I think, from Czechoslovakia. And very paradoxically, and I really don't understand what the mental process was, my father was anti-Jewish, um, even though he was making money out of them. <laughs> And um, he used to refer to Jews as shonks, um, um, which is some sort of cliche, some sort of um, insulting word for a Jew. Um, and the Second World War and the frightful things that happened in the Second World War didn't seem to affect that at all. And it carried over into my mother because she'd refer to, she'd say about somebody, oh, well, of course they're Jews. And um, you couldn't say that mm. <laughs> you know by the 1950s or early 60s you couldn't say that and I so I had to say, say to her look you know you just can't say that about people they're, they're, they're people you know mm. they're, they're not special because they're Jews um, or they are but I mean not in the way she was using it and um, so um, he was a very curious mixture he tended to vote liberal I think but out of perverseness I suspect because nobody else did and um, he was um, v he was disorganised. His his study was a terrible mess, really frightful. I mean, heaps of stuff everywhere. And um, my mother used to try and tidy him up, but without any success. So I was brought up and uh, behind all those um, card indexes and so on lies a mother who says you must not be like your father. I was wondering. It was a very close connection, isn't that? And uh, I used to love. I yeah, loved going to my Aunt Bim, who was, lived in Chelsfield. We used to go, I used to go with my Aunt Margot to Chelsfield for, at weekends, to just visit her for the day. And she made gooseberry pie, which I loved, and still do love. And um, so I loved going there. And after we'd had the gooseberry pie, I'd clear out one of her cupboards. And uh, she'd, uh, I'd say to her, she's my great aunt, I'd, I'd say, You'll be glad when this is done, Bim. And she said, I'm glad now, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to love clearing out cupboards. And you see, that's what historians do. They, they, they tidy up things. They, they make sense of chaos. They, they, they find buried treasure and so on. And all that goes right the way back, you see. 
um, and uh, um, the war also, of course, had a profound effect because we, when I was three or thereabouts, we moved to Stanmore from Belsize Park, and um, <coughs> Stanmore was a suburban estate which was half finished, and the war stopped the, the estate being built. I mean, it's still there now, of course, and you can see it's all built up now. But there were lots of spaces between the houses where they'd not had time to build the houses, and. Um, they were full of railway trucks and things, uh, all rusting, uh, left left over from the builders who'd been interrupted by the war, and so we had the most wonderful time on these these building plots. And there were trees and fields around about, and um, Bentley Priory was near there where the um, the bomber command was. It was a lovely place to spend one's childhood, and um, highly suburban. I've been suburban all my life. What is being suburban and in your life? And it's a combination mean? of privacy and um, companionship, and it's an ideal mixture. And I've never had any of this snobbish objection to being suburban. I, um, my mother used to occasionally use the word suburban pejoratively, but I never have. Uh, it's the ideal compromise, really. Um, and uh, we were. I had a with a gang of friends of mine there and we roamed around totally uninterrupted as was common among children no doubt you did the same without any supervision there was no, nobody no fear of any molestation or anything like that you went off on your bicycles and we went off on bicycles or we were just roaming around uh, and um, do you have hobbies oh lots yes uh, um, cigarette covers was one thing cigarette packet covers which we picked up out of the gutter and, and put st stuck them in envelopes. I was a great collector then and still am really and those things there are temperance um, uh, crockery um, so I'm still collecting really. um, and um, uh, I used to collect all sorts of things. I had a stamp collection. I, had a, I was very well, I, was n I never wanted for anything. Um, and of course, if you've never seen a banana, you didn't worry about not having them. <laughs> I remember my father drawing a banana around about <laughs> 1947, saying that's what they look like. And um, I remember having my first banana, which must have been a year or so after that, and, and wishing it would never end. <laughs> <laughs> I remember where I was sitting when I ate it. And um, so um, the war had the effect of maximizing the companionship side of neighborhood because the men were mostly away on war work or mm -hmm. actually at war and the women got together and um, for instance my, we my mother and I had jaundice when I was nine and, and the neighbors weighed, weighed in and, and brought food in and things like that and um, there's a great deal of sort of fellow feeling, really. Um, of course, that nourished the anti-Jewish feeling because um, the thing that really terrified the, the, everybody in the state, really, was whether the place would be taken over by Jews because they were moving out across northwest London towards us <laughs> because they were doing well. They'd come out of East End, they got as far as Golders Green and Hendon, and they were likely to move further out. And um, of course, that that was appalling. I mean, because that would drag the estate down. You know, you only had to listen to them speaking to to see that would drag the estate down. I remember my parents complaining about somebody shouting to her husband in the garden through an upstairs window. You just didn't do that sort of thing. And it was a class thing, partly. Mm. Um, I think uh, they were frightened of the, the the estate going down, as the expression was. Um, and uh, so. It's, it's not so much social aspiration as drives them as the fear of going down. Mm. You see, the, um, my mother's family, the, 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 the seven siblings, were at risk of going down. And my mother's class consciousness and desire for education for me and so on was to stop that happening in her case. And they all clutched on to the one brother who had money, Geoffrey and who he bailed them out. He never married, and he was really, to put it crudely, plundered, really. And he was a very good-hearted man. And, uh, you know, they clutched onto him as their one sort of refuge to prevent them from sinking. And um, 
my father was dragging my mother down. She always was told that he, she'd married beneath her. And um, so she, that was another source of friction, really. She used to refer to people as being provincial, uh, which meant that they came from north of, north of Watford, really. Um, <laughs> and my father was decidedly provincial, coming from Hull. And he used to get awfully cross when she used that expression. Um, but it was a class thing, really. Um, and my father was a very kind man. He, um, he, he subsidised his brother, my uncle, uh, in getting through university. And he eventually became a university registrar, I think. He did quite well, anyway. Um, and uh, there was a great uh, self-help tradition and, and uh, kindness, really. But you see, it's typical of my father. When I went to Malta on national service, he used to send parcels um, of chocolate, which I'm extremely fond of. I'm a chocoholic. <laughs> and um, the, these parcels would contain uh, a lot of chocolate and biscuits and things like that, which I greatly welcome, but, uh, but they were, um, they'd gone white. And they, they, they were, he hadn't noticed that in the shop that he kept by that time, and I'll fill you in on that later, uh, that they, they, they passed their best date, so <laughs> to speak. And um, he was sort of disorganized, you see. And um, uh, so he was very kind to send these parcels, but the parcels were largely uneatable, <laughs> <laughs> even by me. <laughs> um, and um, he was very disorganized. Um, so, uh, his bi he had an accountancy business, and um, that, I'm just trying to think how it worked. Oh, the toy, the toy business eventually folded up, and the accountancy drained down to nothing. So he was sinking, mm. and uh, that's why the bills weren't paid. And um, so my mother was determined that we should not sink any further. And um, so uh, she went out to work for a part-time job. Uh, which was something middle-class women didn't do in those days. <coughs> and um, it was brave of her, really. And it was, in fact, the making of her because she discovered that she was a very good manager. And um, she eventually, uh, well, her brother set them both up in a shop in North Kensington, which was an area of, uh, working-class area with black immigrants beginning to come in. And um, they ran this sub post office as a corner on a corner shop, and ran it very successfully. It did very well, so much so that they got a second shop in the Harrow Road. And um, uh, the way things were going, my mother continued to run the old shop in North Kensington. My father ran the Harrow Road shop. And when I came back from the army when I was 21. I found that the marriage was breaking up. I was not a happy homecoming, really. And um, uh, my father was then running Harrow Road Shop on his own, and I volunteered to, to open it on Sundays, because he'd stopped. It wasn't doing very well. He'd stopped opening it on a Sunday. So I said, well, I'll open it on a Sunday for you, and uh, um, we'll... Uh, see whether there's any custom there. Because, just to explain, I had worked behind the counter as a teenager for them, rather enjoyed doing so when I was in the other shop. Uh, and, you know, I'm a natural entrepreneur, really, partly as a result of that. Um, and um, so I knew how to be behave behind the counter. And um, so I went on my own that Sunday. I only did it one Sunday. And um, I thought he just really ought to know what his stock was like, you know, why people weren't buying it. So um, I sort of looked around and found some boxes of chocolates and things that were, were really literally gone white. And I said, well, there weren't many, many customers, but I think I know why. Um, um, there's um, the stock, a lot of the stock is, is not in good condition. It's all right, he said. Um, he says, nothing wrong with it. 
So I said, well, look, I'm telling you, but you know, that is the situation. My father, you couldn't tell my father anything, really. Um, he was never wrong, um, uh, but um, I did my best. Uh, and um, uh, so I didn't uh, persist with that experiment, but he was nonetheless very good for me and uh, to me. And um, I needed to get some money together because I was coming up to Oxford. And so, um, I went, I went on a bicycle down to Kilburn uh, because my mother said, my mother was terrified that I would actually hang about and, and sponge off them. She said, you must get a job. Yes, on your bike. Yes, quite. And um, I was sort of appalled because I had the slightest idea how to get a job. Anyway, I went to an employment agency, filled in a form, and was really rather shocked at how little I could offer <laughs> because <laughs> the only thing I could do was to type. Uh, and of course I was, had a good education at school and um, so that was one of the reasons why I really made myself a proficient typist because I thought that at the very least I would be able to do that you know. um, but in fact I didn't get a job typing my father said well look I know one of the buyers in, in uh, Selfridges I'll have a word with him and he did, and um, I got a job in the gramophone record department through no merit of my own, it was just my father p putting in a word for me. And um, I, 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 I say slightly reluctantly, I was extremely good at it <laughs> because I developed a technique, there were two techniques. We were paid on commission, so it was rather important to do it well uh, if you wanted money. Um, I had two techniques, one was to fix our, through eye contact, the customers as they were approaching the department, uh, the counter, so that <laughs> the other assistants couldn't understand why all the customers came to me and not to them. Uh, and secondly, I had a little notebook um, where I noted down useful record numbers so that when they asked for something, I could find it quickly. So I actually sold things very quickly. And you know, I did earn. I, th I suspect more commission than anybody else there and I know it's rather they were very tolerant because they didn't take it out I mean they knew I'd only be there for six months before I went to Oxford anyway, I suppose but anyway um, I was called aside by the the head of the department Mr I can't remember his name Mr Kemp Kemp his name or Kemp his name was he said the personnel manager would like to see you before you go so I went to see the personnel manager and he said well uh, you're going to Oxford if you want to come back and work for us you can we'll be pleased to see you so I said um, I didn't know what I wanted to do then but I I remember that and thank you very much um, so uh, my, I owed that to my father you see my father put in a word mm. um, um, and um, that worked out well enough and I enjoyed selling records I'm very fond of music and, and my mother that's one thing I owe to my mother my mother was very fond of music she played Debussy a lot uh, and she was very fond of Debussy and um, she was trained in the Second World War at the Wigmore Hall in piano playing she used to play the piano quite a lot and um, I still uh, think of her when I hear certain Chopin Nocturnes or whatever, because she used to play those, or uh, wonderful Schubert, um, um, oh, intermezzos. Um, and uh, she gave me a love of music, and as a teenager that gradually developed, I got a gramophone uh, player, and um, so I enjoyed selling records, it really interested me, and um, I, I was, as I say, really quite good at it. Can I just ask you a little more about music? Yes, do, yes. Um, Firstly, taste. I mean, is it all classical music? Yes. Um, uh, I have a very vague memory of sitting with my back against a pillar um, in, the, in the upstairs classroom in Arquin House School at the age of about seven, singing. <laughs> I had a very good voice in the sense that I, had a very, I still have a good sense of tune. Mm. I, I can get into a tune without any revving up sort of thing. Um, so I was obviously rather good at singing then and uh, I think it's partly because my mother used to sing to me, my father used to as well. I can uh, remember what they sang and um, 
so I had that background, but I never was taught the piano. I wish I had been, but my parents were very sensible. They didn't, uh, they didn't um, force it on me. Um, so I never learned the piano, uh, even though my mother played it. Um, but when I was about 14, I sort of expressed an interest in learning the piano. My uncle Geoffrey paid for me to have a year's um, lessons at Merchant Taylor's School. And I didn't make much progress on it, really, not because I didn't enjoy it, but because I was terribly busy with O-levels at that time, and then A-levels. I just didn't have the time to practice, and uh, so I gave it up after a year. But nonetheless, I gradually acquired a, a love of music, and that was the time when long-playing records were coming out. Um, I initially started off by buying 78s, as they were, I remember running between bus stops to, to accumulate enough money to buy a 78 record at the end of the week because I was allowed to keep the travel money to Merchant Taylor's if I somehow saved it. <laughs> so I used to run between bus stops and used to buy these records. And um, I, I mean, the earliest things I liked were obvious things like green sleeves and then eventually we had some neighbours called Frank and Nellie Robinson who were extremely good to me in retrospect and my mother used to go up there to sort of chat to them in the evenings and uh, eventually I was allowed to go with her and they had a long playing gramophone record uh, gramophone machine and um, they had Grieg's piano concerto on it uh, they played on it and I fell in love with that and then um, we had uh, concerts at Merchant Taylor's School which were held at Watford Town Hall and you could get a free ticket and I used to go with friends to hear those, I used to cycle to uh, Watford uh, Town Hall and we used to get free tickets and I picked up most of what I knew about music then. Sibelius symphonies were very much the thing in those days, I still love them and um, the obvious things, Beethoven symphonies, Tchaikovsky symphonies and then I went to the proms and it all took off from there and in fact I'm going to six proms this year um, but purely as a listener, I mean, not as a performer at all. What about, can you see any connection between it and your work in the sense that some people listen to music and are inspired and make, make them no. for example or do you work to music ever? No, or? never, no. I find it too much of a distraction. Mm. Uh, no, uh, there's no connection of that kind uh, at all that I can think of. I'm very interested in the history of music, of course, for obvious reasons, but it's not well written about. I mean, uh, there are some really good books to be written about it. It doesn't tend to be written, and nor does the history of painting tend to be written about well. It's, n it's not set into context. Mm. Um, and so I don't find books about the history of music at all interesting, but mm. I mean, I'm interested in music. Mm. and the technology of music and so on, but in a totally amateur way. Um, and um, so uh, the Robinsons were very influential on me, really. He was a self-made man, uh, and that was a term of abuse, really, for my mother. He didn't know what was what or how to speak properly and that sort of thing. But nonetheless, he did very well. He worked in Kodak which had a huge factory in Wheelstone at that time nearby and um, he made a lot of money, they were very well off and he, he epitomised prudence and success in my mother's eyes even though he was a self-made man. He was financially secure, that's what she admired and uh, anyway, I think he was in love with her actually. Uh, in fact he made one or two propositions to her which she rejected. She'd given the wrong signals as usual. Mm. Um, anyway, that, and she once, I think Mrs. Robinson, who was a, again an extremely nice woman, she once caught him with his hand on my mother's knee. And my mother went up during the daytime to see Mrs. Robinson, Nellie Robinson. She said, I'm awfully, she said, I'm awfully sorry, um, there's nothing in this, um, but you know, I'll stop seeing your seeing you if you prefer that. And she said, no, he, he likes you coming. And uh, basically she was quite secure in her hold on him, I think, but she was also a very nice woman. And um, so my mother kept going, but you know, that stopped any overt um, mm. approach. 
mm. from him but um, he he was fascinated by her I think and she admired him mm. and so I went up to see them you know I used to go with her to see them um, but uh, they eventually fell out um, uh, uh, they were important in all sorts of ways because my father when he was not being successful when I was about 14 he had this pipe dream of going to New Zealand uh, and you know the new life and um, so we were all set to go to New Zealand and my mother agreed to go and so on and Frank Robinson came to the house during the daytime and said to my mother don't go and my mother put her foot down and didn't go and probably wisely because it would have been a disaster probably if they'd <laughs> gone and so that meant I stayed at Merchant Taylor's and the rest is history so to speak but um so he had a very important influence in that way but my mother then later again giving the wrong signals and this was fatal um when she was um, uh, um going out part-time to work she needed to drive to work and um she took lessons she had learned to drive before the second world war but she nearly drove a hole in the back end of our garage and my, <laughs> my father said you ought to do any more driving. Anyway, she decided she must learn to drive. As I say, the going to um, work, out to work was the making of her. She discovered all sorts of things in, that she could do that she didn't realise she could do and one of them was learning to drive. She went out to drive with this driving instructor who was 10 years younger than her. The inevitable happened she uh, had an affair with him um, and separated from my father and um, uh, at that stage I stayed with my father though a bit torn and um, so my father and I lived together and my mother was off with this man and eventually her sister, her elder sister was a wonderful woman, Margot actually I was very fond of her um, she noticed that my mother had marks on her face and so she asked her sister how she'd got these marks on her face so my, my mother said oh um, it was some fat that came up from the frying pan into my face but in fact he was knocking her about and um, so all hands on deck to get her away from him <laughs> so what happened how did you get your mother out of that scrape well, I didn't get her out. She wanted to get out, I think. I mean, the situation was that, she, as I say, she gave the wrong signals. She got ta tangled up with it to be got out mm. by somebody. And uh, so she half wanted to get out. Mm. And um, what happened was she actually came to live with her sister. And um, uh, she was very generous, my mother. She lent her car, a Morris Minor, to... Um, Roy, the man she fell for, or who fell for her, and um, so the strategy was to get this car back. <laughs> <laughs> and he lived in North Harrow, and my father, who loved this sort of thing, my father had a huge collection of detective novels, and he loved this sort of thing. We devised a, a way of getting this car back. He had the car parked because we'd done a reconnaissance outside his parents' house where he was living. And we had a key uh, to it, the, uh, we, it was a duplicate key. And so he said, you get, I'll drive you up there, you get in the car and I'll uh, drive ahead of you and we'll go off. And it worked like clockwork, it was just like something out of a film. Um, <laughs> he dropped me off. I got into the car, it started first thing, thank goodness, and off we swept. <laughs> and uh, I saw Roy in the front room, uh, astonished at what was happening, and he was too late, we'd gone. <laughs> <laughs> so we got the car back. Um, I should explain that Roy, a reasonable enough chap really, I didn't particularly care for him, I didn't dislike him. And um, for a time I used to go up to Selfridges with them, I mean, I was really sort of mm. shuttling between the two, and um, eventually he made it clear to my mother that he didn't want me in the car, um, and so I then went with my father. You know, I mean, obviously, obviously didn't want me there, um, but um, 
so I knew him quite well um, and uh, eventually we as I say we got her away and eventually she lived in a temporary flat in Pembridge Villas in North Kensington which was near where her shop was and eventually my uncle Geoffrey uh, funded her in a little cottage which is there's a picture of it in the hall um, and uh, she lived there very happily she she really was perfectly happy on her own and she used to go around to people and you know suggest to them it might be a good idea for them to part I mean she used to preach to the <laughs> freedom of, of escaping from your spouse and she um, she did actually sort of act as a sort of confidant to several members of her staff to get them away, away from their husbands <laughs> You, I mean, you dwelt on this, your parents, quite a bit. Mm. Um, one psychological interpretation of this, you, you've mentioned the tidiness. Uh, yes. Sorting out. Uh, and you've also mentioned your workaholic mm -hmm. streak. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose someone might suggest that maybe some home unhappiness and moving from one mm -hmm. family to the other, the one sure part of your life was your work. Yes, I, there's a lot in that, in the sense that Oxford was a refuge from all this, certainly. Mm. And I used to stay up in the vacations a lot, mm. um, rather than go to one or other home. Mm. Mm. So it's certainly true in that sense. It's true in another sense, in that um, I had the same fear that my mother had of slipping socially. Mm. Um, and um, I saw them both slipping, uh, or rescued in, in my mother's case by her brother, and I was determined not to slip, mm. and the only way out of that was passing examinations. Mm. Um, and um, so in that sense it's relevant. Um, and um, I remember for a time I lived with my father, who eventually married one of his assistants, um, Doris, who, very nice woman again, and, uh, but it was it was a sort of low-grade suburb of North London. I thought, I'm never going to go any lower than this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, you, you obviously will realise that I'm, I've got all the class consciousness my mother had. I mean, she put that onto me. But, mm. of course, British society was then very class conscious. It still mm. is, but I mean, mm. very class conscious then, particularly mm. in the suburbs. Mm. And um, so um, you're right in that hypothesis, in that sense. Um, but you're not right about work, work being an escape in the sense of, you see, it was all there when I was five mm. in that school report, mm. you see. Mm. And my parents were perfectly happy for the first ten years or so, I think, of yeah. their marriage. Uh, it only started to go wrong when I was a teenager, really. Well, coming back to your teenagers, um, were there any, at Merchant Taylor's, were there any teachers who particularly inspired Oh, yes, you? yes, yes. Can, do you remember them? Yes. I mean, I should start, really, by uh, Miss Dalglish uh, at prep school. She was mm. a very good teacher and um, very um, sympathetic teacher, encouraging. Then there was Miss Keast, who was a fascinating woman who shook. She sort of had some sort of disability, <laughs> I don't know what it was, but she shook. And so initially she terrified me. I think this was one reason why I had a term off from school, because Miss Dalglish was ill. I was very fond of Miss Dalglish, and Miss Keith, Miss Keith was taking over, and I was terrified of this mm. woman. And she had money spiders in her hair, and it was all piled up. I mean, she's, you know, children are very frightened by things mm. like that, at least some children are. And um, so, but they were both very good teachers, as a lot of um, unmarried women were in those mm -hmm. days. And uh, then Darcy Yeo, the headmaster, was also very good, though a bit of a sadist, but I mean, he was a good teacher. He was the, the one only, who pulled your hair. He, he didn't ever pull mine for some reason, but he certainly pulled some others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was terrible. In retrospect, mm -hmm. I, I didn't somehow see it as terrible at the time. It's just mm -hmm. you accept what happens. But anyway. He gave me a very good education, so I got into Merchant Taylors. I was then on the science side for some reason, because I was quite good at maths, um, and stayed on the science side for the first three years at Merchant Taylors. And I eventually, I was slipping all the time in the rank order in the, in the form. And the subjects I was slipping in were science subjects. And I noticed this. And, um, I thought this won't do. Mm. 
I wasn't used to being at the bottom of the form or getting near the bottom, which I was by the end of the third year. Um, so when I in the science sixth A, uh, and I hated physics, I hated practical physics practicals. I have no practical aptitude at all, and um, they were the absolute pits for me. I was no good at ge geometry either. There's some something about geometry that really doesn't fit with me at all. And um, eventually I decided that this can't go on. And um, I said, I w there was a, another boy, oddly enough, named Harrison. You remember initials? He was G.E.B. Harrison. I remember his initials in school days. He had moved across from the science side to the art side. And I talked to him at one stage and said, you know, how do you do it? What's it like? And he said it was all right. It was very rarely done. but. Um, so I, so I said, well, I, I'd like to switch. So the school was against it, and my parents were against it because they thought it was a bad career move, among other things. Anyway, I said uh, I wanted to sh shift the, uh, to the art side, uh, so I did. And um, uh, I was immediately in my element. And um, I was good at Latin still, because I inherited that from, from the... Um, the prep school and um, so went into what was called the history sixth uh, and the master who ran that was a chap called Alex Jeffries who was an avuncular very kind very nice man um, who really for me was a sort of father figure because you see I've been to some extent put away put against my father by my mm. mother and he was the father I didn't have in a sense in fact, long before I ever came under his tutelage, um, I got lost, I should tell you. When you go to a big school like that from a small prep school, you get lost and mm. terrified. And I couldn't find out, it was early on when I went there, I couldn't find out where I was supposed to be at what time. So I stood outside the master's common room and looked for somebody who looked friendly, and it was him, mm. it was he and asked him where I should be. Um, so he said, don't worry, he said, um, I'll um, look at the timetable and tell you. And he told me where I should be and I, I went there. So he, he was a friendly person even before I ever knew him. But anyway, he was uh, ran the sixth form and was a very good teacher. Not, he wasn't high powered intellectually really, but he was inspirational and very encouraging. He encouraged us to give talks to the class, for instance, if we got up for ourselves, and I gave quite a lot of those. And he was encouraging in every way. He was also an extremely tolerant person, which my father wasn't, uh, and so I admired that. And um, he, was, um, he was a veteran of the First World War, and uh, I remember two things about that quite vividly. He described what it was like uh, being an army officer in the First World War, and he and he described the guns. He he had a desk, a sort of beveled desk, and he banged on the desk with his hands uh, to, sh to 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 show us what the guns gunfire was like. And he described how. Um, at one point he was trying to lead on his troop or platoon or whatever it was with this movement you do you know, when you want the troops to move forward you give this movement and nobody moved and they were all dead um, and um, you know it was very vivid really. mm -hmm. he was a very brilliant teacher in that way the other teacher I had in history was well, I had two other very good teachers more than that really but another very good one was Guy Wilson, who's still alive, um, and he was very fresh from Cambridge, self-critical, and he started by giving us notes, which we wrote down, and then he said at the end of the first term, this isn't working, is it? So he said, we'll try something else, and um, I can't remember what he tried. I think we must have had talks or something like that. Anyway, he changed, and it was he who made me into a Victorian, really. I mean, he, we did a special subject on we read uh, one volume in Money, Penny and Buckles, Disraeli, and a volume of, or chapter or something, in, Glads in um, Morley's biography of Gladstone, and I got hooked. And I was the only person in the class who liked Carlyle's French Revolution. And so I was rather, regarded rather a freak <laughs> liking that. And I still like it. I, th mm. I still think it's a great book. 
So he had that effect on me. I had a very good English teacher, really brilliant man, uh, called John Steen, S-T-E-A-N-E, -E, and he was an opera buff as well. And um, he was a homosexual, I now realise, um, though he never made any approaches to me. And um, he was very empathetic. Is he I mean, still he, alive? Uh, no, he died about a year ago of cancer. Hmm. Um, but anyway, he was totally inspirational. I mean, he, he was a devotee of um, F.R. Levis. Hmm. And um, he used to give us... Um, at that time, you... I think in A-level English, because I did A-level English, Latin and um, history, in A-level English you had a piece unseen to criticise and comment mm. on. And um, I remember uh, there was a piece of D.H. Lawrence, a piece of poetry from D.H. Lawrence about, uh, about a child sitting under a piano on a Sunday evening and hearing the tinkling of the keys. And um, he would, we would see this blind and we would be asked to comment on it. We didn't know it was D.H. Lawrence. And... Um, so I, I commented on it and um, I had some ideas of my own and uh, I suddenly realised that I could actually have ideas of my own. I mean, I, I hadn't read this, I'd thought about it. And he was very good in that way. It really was quite, uh, quite a moment. And um, another episode which I, where I still think I was right and he was wrong, though, though it shows the sort of class it was. We had a passage from Nash, the uh, Elizabethan uh, author, and he described the disemboweling of a, of a man who committed treason, and um, the heart was taken out like a plum from a porridge pot, I remember, I remember, it, remember the phrase, and I said in my comment that this was um, uh, a terrible image for us but it probably would have been less terrible at the time because people were used in Elizabethan society to all sorts of brutal things happening. That wasn't a legitimate comment he said, that was a historical comment, it wasn't a critical comment. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean it was that sort of discussion we had and um, it was very very inspirational. I had another very good t t teacher called uh, R.B. Hunter who taught for me for Wordsworth, um, which was one of the set books, and we, we read the, um, the, the prelude. And um, again, I sort of, I got quite hooked on the prelude and, and um, you know, the, the visionary gleam and all that. Um, and um, I wrote what must have been, I suppose, by his lights, a good essay. And he, he wrote at the bottom of it, I probably still got it somewhere, um, you could actually go to Oxford or Cambridge um, and that was the first time anybody has ever said that to me and uh, you know, very conscientious mm. very good teachers mm. um, and eventually I got a scholarship to St John's the Sir Thomas White scholarship for history went up to the Merchant Taylor's Hall for the interview and it was quite a funny occasion I remember because um, I suppose Keith Thomas must have been a tutor then, certainly one of the young tutors who I didn't know, said, you said such and such in your, your essay. And I said, did I say that? <laughs> they all <laughs> laughed. Uh, because I was incredulous, I could have said such a silly thing. Mm. Um, uh, but I, that, that, that went fine. And um, we eventually, as scholars, went for an interview for, for a dinner at the Merchant mm. Taylor's Hall a grand dinner, the first time I'd ever been to a grand dinner and I remember sitting opposite somebody and it was a time when the British were just having trouble in Cyprus and uh, some government minister had said we will never leave Cyprus and I said I thought that was a very silly thing to say oh that was my brother-in-law he said <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, so that, you see, that got me to St. John's, and that was, I was absolutely sitting pretty then, because uh, I had my two years national service, and then went to St. John's, and my friends were there. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so we sat together at what we call the scholars' table, and um, I had a set of friends ready-made. Uh, it was all dead easy, really. Last it, thing about uh, Merchant Taylors, if, mm. um, well, two things. One is, did you have any particular activities there, I mean drama uh, or sports or anything that you... I was hopeless at sport, absolutely hopeless. Couldn't see, you see, because I was short-sighted. Mm. I uh, got, um, I had glasses from the age of eight. I remember coming back from the optician 
with the glasses fitted and my mother saying you do look funny and <laughs> I was terribly upset mm. quite the wrong thing to say and I hated wearing glasses and and um, it took me years and years to get used to wearing them because it meant I was hopeless on the sports mm. field even if I had any aptitude which I didn't mm. so um, I went in for swimming uh, because we had a um, you could, if you didn't like cricket, you could go in for life saving, as it was mm. called. So I, I had no enthusiasm for saving lives, but I had every enthusiasm for getting out of cricket. <laughs> so um, I did life saving and uh, made. I still got a friend actually, who, who was uh, the bond between us is a mutual hatred of rugby football on Saturday afternoons in the mid middle of the winter. It's a real bond there. Uh, <laughs> Indeed. Um, so I hated that. What I did do was, um, I remember when I went across the, from one side of the school to the other, one rather um, patronising young man called Willoughby, now deceased, said to me, now everybody in this form does something, uh, something distinctive. So um, I thought, oh, well, what am I going to do? I certainly can't shine on the sports field. Anyway, what I did was, apart from doing well academically, um, was uh, calligraphy. I mean, I'll show you upstairs, mm. I've still got it on the wall, um, a huge piece of calligraphy, which, as the art master said, was a feat of character, <laughs> it was a, an artistic product. And um, it's uh, there up on the wall there. So I did that, um, but I didn't do anything else much. Mm. I, I worked very hard uh, academically, because I had to, you see, I had to justify having moved across the school Mm. into the arts uh, and anyway my parents weren't well off so I had to sort of justify their expenditure well, What about religion because this is, were you confirmed? Yes I was, I'm rather ashamed of that fact now um, again it's my mother you see they, they were very uh, the whole family were anti-intellectual and anti-religious they, they, they didn't like anything involving pretentiousness or, or falseness and um, so they didn't like people who went to church they thought they were hypocrites and um, but nonetheless being confirmed was part of the it's the rite of passage in your upward move or your attempt to stay in the same <laughs> position socially so I got confirmed and um, you know, I went through a fairly religious phase um, as teenagers tend to do really at least then did because it was, it actually the Church of England was really quite powerful as an influence in public schools then as you'll probably remember and um, so you know I sort of struggled for some sort of faith at that time uh, but never found it and um, I greatly admired Cormac Rigby who you may remember do you? Yes, I um, do. Uh, he was a contemporary at St John's uh, Roman Catholic and I admired the way he used to go off to mass regularly and so on he took David McLennan with him and David actually became a Roman Catholic as a result mm. of his influence, I think. And at, at one stage, I went to Cormac and said, look, um, I'd like to sort of know more about Catholicism. And he said, well, I can't tell you, but there is the thing called the Catholic Truth Society. Write to them and they'll help you. So I wrote to them and they sent me leaflets. And I got a, a booklet which said, the Pope is, the title of it, The Pope is Infallible. And that finished me off. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, no, I'm not having any of this. And, um, and my parents, of course, were terrified by becoming a Catholic. The, uh, the only thing that was worth, worse than being a Catholic was to become a ballet dancer. <laughs> they were particularly worried that I might become that because I got very enthusiastic for ballet when I was about 14 because the Robinsons used to take me and my mother off to the Royal Festival Hall to watch ballet and I loved it and mm. still do and um, they were terrified I had to go into that not that I would have had the slightest aptitude um, so um, uh, that, that was, that's the end of religion and I know I've sort of always remained an agnostic and not an atheist so I'm not militant about it but um, I've never seen any evidence for it and if anything being a historian has turned me the other way because um, one small episode at school which is relevant here is um, a, a sort of prank that we played um, <clears throat> in the classical lower six where I was for a year um, 
they had what's called a, a clepsydra. They made what's called a clepsydra. Who, uh, you, you probably know about this. Mm. Um, it's a um, it's a water clock. Oh, yes. And um, there were in the great hall at school. There were apertures in the ceiling, which could be opened. There was a fencing loft above it, and if you knew your way around the fencing loft, you could open these things. Anyway, they put the clepside. Uh, there was a, a plot. <laughs> in the summer, at the end of the summer term, for putting a clepsydra above one of these holes, opening up the hole, putting a clepsydra uh, uh, on top of it, and attaching to the arm that tilted when a certain amount of water had gone out mm. to a toilet roll, which <laughs> then plunged down, to, much to everybody's excitement, into the hall in the, in the assembly after prayers. And so we did this, we organised this, it was all a conspiracy within the form, and um, um, it worked like a dream, <laughs> and we meet every year. We still do um, to celebrate this event. Um, <laughs> and um, I was like, how, "How did I get onto this?" What were we religion? Oh, uh, religion. Yes, I don't quite are. know how we got onto this. Uh, probably school, really. Anyway, oh yes, I know how we got onto it. It's this that um, I I was appointed uh, about. 20 years ago, a historian of this group, because they they call themselves the Rollers, and um, so I wrote a history of the event, mm. and um, um, I said uh, there were some many contradictory accounts because I had talked to all the people, all the people wrote to me about what had happened, and there were a lot of contradictory accounts. Some of them said that the lavatory roll had fallen on the headmaster's head, for example, <laughs> which it didn't. Um, and others said that it um, that one of the monitors tried to tear off a, a strip from it and failed to bring the whole thing down. <laughs> <laughs> it was really quite a memorable event, actually, as they go these events. And um, anyway, at the end of that history that I wrote of it, I said um, that it's extraordinary that after only twenty years, when all of us are present, we don't remember exactly what happened or even what day it was. Uh, a fortiori, or words to that effect. Um, what credence can we attach to many other documents prepared after the event? And one of the my contemporaries at Merchant Taylors in the groups, uh, the nonconformists, objected to this. <laughs> so I removed the direct reference to the Bible, but that's what lay behind it. Mm. And um, I've never felt any any temptation towards religion at all. And when I listen to the radio now, radio broadcasts of religious service, I think, how on earth can they believe all that junk? You know, it doesn't influence me in the slightest. I'm, a, I'm attracted, of course, to the uh, buildings mm. and the cultural significance of it. As why why have you got a large collection of biographies of bishops? Oh, well, it's just religious history. I mean, it's just because mm. bishops were important in the 19th century, not because I'm interested in, in religion as such. Mm. I'm interested in history. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's get to national service. Yes. Um, you were presumably eight, 18 when you went to Malta. Yes. Yes. You spent the two years in Malta? Nearly two years. I mean, what you start off with is Catterick. Mm. Um, I was in the Royal Signals. And um, I do wish my parents had kept my letters because I'd love to read them now. I wrote back at least once a week, I think, to them. But my mother was uh, true to form, threw everything away. Once she'd read them, never kept anything. Uh, so they've all gone. Um, though I've got the letters that I received from, I've mm. still got them. Um, and um, it was a most extraordinary experience. The, the, the first six weeks we were simply treated as irks, as they're called, as ordinary soldiers, and uh, pushed around the drill square and rushing and pin of It was like a sort of nightmare, really, a most peculiar experience. But also, uh, at times, extremely funny. And uh, because it's like being a schoolboy again, and you know the masters, you know, you're sort of laughing at them behind their backs. We had um, two a corporal and a lance corporal running our particular section in that six weeks, and um, I remember them. We were we were required to clean out the lavatories with our hands, and um, uh, a lot of reference to the cleaning out the bleeding shit. 
<laughs> which was a combination of bad language I hadn't heard before. Uh, Keith Thomas says the same about mm. his recollection mm. of national service. I mean, really crude combinations of words. <clears throat> and I remember thinking, what a ghastly sort of situation. <laughs> We're going to get through this sometime, somehow. And I was, um, ooh, there was a lot of talk at night after the lights were out and some extremely funny people among among the people I was with. But anyway, that was the first six weeks. And then you went on to Oxu, I think it was called, another six weeks or so, or maybe three months, I can't remember now, uh, where we were trained for the, the Oxu exam, uh, training to become an army officer. And um, that was quite a memorable experience because when we went from one side of Catterick to the other, to this Octu training place, it was absolute hell because um, I remember we, we, we were told that we'd got to get this spider, they were called spiders, the um, sheds uh, mm. of barracks uh, that were left over, I suppose, from the Second World War. And we, we were told that in that weekend on our arrival, we had to get the whole thing in order and absolutely spick and span. And uh, we were absolutely driven from pillar to post. And uh, and and um, I remember seeing one chap cleaning a window like that, and an officer coming round saying, "Both hands, both hands." <laughs> 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 You're doing that. And uh, we were told that if we didn't feel we could stand the pace, we could sign an ND form, as it was called, non desirous form, to opt out from it. And. Um, uh, I must say, I felt at times I would like to sign that form. Anyway, I didn't. And um, eventually, uh, on the Sunday night, um, at the end of the barrack room, I suddenly heard a lot of laughter. And um, it was all a hoax. Um, it, was, it was the next course above us, dressing up as officers, and making us get the whole place in order because we had to get in order anyway but but having us on and it's left never left me the memory of what a uniform can do um it can completely change your relationships with people um, <laughs> and um so um that happened and then we got trained uh, 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 for officer training and um there was a lot of very high power drill they're never as high power as it was at Merchant Taylor's. <laughs> and um, um, you then went up to, for what was called WASBY, War Office Selection Board, and you had to do things like carrying a barrel across a stream and mm. directing a group of people and having projects uh, for, for, for getting from A to B and also interviews and all that. Anyway, I, I passed that. And uh, uh, it was something I expected, I, I felt I should pass because public school boys didn't fail WASPY, you know, <laughs> you just passed it, you know, that's sort of your position. And uh, so I was very glad I did because I wasn't sure I would. And then you went on to MONS, um, which was uh, another six week course near Bisley. Again, a lot of drillers, I remember. And we, I learned to lecture in that. That was quite a good thing to do. Um, and a lot of skills I used. And I, for instance, in those cards in there, there are a lot of abbreviated words that I use. And that, those abbreviations originated with the abbreviations we used in the army. Um, uh, I've got my own personal shorthand, but it originated with that. So you write ACCN for accommodation, for example. Mm. Um, and so on. Um, and uh, so eventually I got commissioned and uh, I invited my parents, as everybody did, to the commissioning parade and in, in Catterick. And uh, because we went back to Catterick for the last stages of the course. Again, that had all sorts of unpleasant aspects, but nonetheless, uh, I survived that. Um, and um, uh, my parents were coming up and I said to my mother, can you make sure my father dresses properly? <laughs> you know how terrified young people are about their parents and whether they look all right and so on. My, my father embarrassed me terribly when he came to my public school because he just didn't bother with his appearance at all. My mother used to look absolutely dressed to the nines. She came along with her 
husband who looked really rather a shambles. So I said, can you make sure he, he, he's dressed all right? Anyway, he saw my letter to her somehow, I don't know how, and took great offence. And uh, I then wrote to him, and, and uh, what my aunt said had been a very, it obviously been passed around the family, had been a very tactful letter saying that I'd be very sorry if he didn't come, and I didn't, I didn't want to give any offence and so on and so forth. He came and he was properly dressed. <laughs> um, and uh, so that passed off all right. And uh, then I was free to go off to Malta. I went to Malta Signal Squadron and uh, ran the military transport uh, section there. There was a lot of, uh, about five or six Maltese drivers, you know, grown men, I mean, they're in their 40s and 50s. And uh, then a few Maltese other ranks and a corporal and um, a number of English. It's a mixture, uh, anglo maltese mixture. And um, again, I was struck with how easily one is influenced by one's environment. I mean, we despised the Maltese. Um, they were incapable of running things or doing anything. It was the t same time as when people said the Suez Canal couldn't be run by Egyptians, you know. Mm. Um, and so we called them the Malts. And I just inherited this from my surroundings. I didn't think this at first, but I just, like a chameleon, I adapted to my environment. This was about 1955. This was 56 to 8. 56 I was 8. in Malta from mm. 57 to 8. Um, and um, I learned to drive there. That's why I learned. I've not got an English driving license. I've driven ever since on a multi, on an army license. Um, because I had to learn to drive. It was ludicrous running a military transport section <laughs> without being able to drive. I used to even take them out on tests, you know, and I didn't couldn't drive myself. So um, that's the way the army worked in those days. And um, so I, I learned a lot of value there. Um, I, I had a motorbike and drove between there and the mess and generally had an interesting life. And it was a most interesting place, a very interesting posting to have. I won't go into details about that, but um, I also learned that I could run things, you know, I, got, I, I knew I could operate behind the counter in my father's post office, but and actually was, I actually went into the post office with my father at the end, and I, I the post office department, a uh, section of it, and I learned, picked that up really quite quickly, and I remember the Pons Asinorum there was a money order payable abroad, and you had to go through a number of hurdles to get a <laughs> to get a, a money order payable abroad sorted out, and I, I learned to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and then uh, I learned Italian there. I taught myself Italian, so that's why I did the Italian special subject later. And um, um, yeah, generally went and walked, went around the whole country. I mean, I knew knew Malta like the back of my hand, really. Um, and uh, in some respects, in many respects, enjoyed it, um, actually. Though I wouldn't say everybody should do it or anything like mm. that, but, I mean, it was quite an eye-opener for me. Mm. Uh, so yeah. is that what you want from National Service or is yes, there more? Yes, that's, that's probably fine because um, we'll, we'll whiz on to University. Yes, I mean uh, another side. Of it, see, I was terribly immature. I was as immature as my mother was in many ways on sexual matters. I remember one of the military transport officers, no, the, one of the um, officers who ran the MT military, the equipment section, was sort of fascinated by prostitutes, and there were an awful lot of prostitutes in in Malta, and. Um, they, they occupied uh, one of the well-known streets in Valletta and <coughs> he, he took, took some of us to, to one of the places where you met these women and I was appalled at the very thought of it, it never occurred to me <laughs> to go to a prostitute um, but um, in, all, in all that department of life I was totally ignorant, and he, well I knew what happened Hmm. But I was I had absolutely no experience at all. So in that sense, I wasn't grown up at all. And my my parents or my mother thought that I would be much more grown up than I was. And she assumed that I was a fully fledged male and so on. Hmm. Um, but I wasn't. Um, and uh, of course, that's the disadvantage of a being an only child and b going to a single sex public school. 
um, they aren't good education from that point of view. Um, so did you have a girlfriend or anything? No girlfriends at all. Well, I had friends who could be male or could be female, but and there, weren't, mm. there wasn't a sexual component mm. to it at all. And uh, that happened a lot later. Um, mm. and, so your uh, work on sex and the Victorians came a lot partly later. partly self-discovery, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but um, I don't want to exaggerate the degree of maturity you emerge from mm. even national service mm. in. But you did come to Oxford, well, a lot later than I did. Are you about 21? 20? Yes, I was 21, yes. Yeah. Well, we thought we were terribly mature, of course, mm. but we weren't. Uh, um, at least I wasn't. And that was um, 58? 58, yes, because I went to, the, to Selfridges from sort of January till... October or something, mm. 58, and then started off with Keith Thomas, Howard Colvin and Michael Hurst as my three tutors. Tell me about, about them as tutors. Um, well, Howard Colvin, uh, you probably know him, he, he was a very scholarly man uh, and it really was a case of absorbing scholarship. Um, uh, what's the word? Um, you just absorb it. You, you're not taught. Osmosis, yes. Osmosis, that's the word. Um, and um, he was a good tutor, really. I mean, he was then just making the transition from being a medieval historian to being an architectural historian. And he had lots of rolls of plans and things on the shelf, mantel shelf in his room. Um, he was very interested in some photographs I took because I was quite a good photographer in those days. And um, I took a lot of photographs in Malta and elsewhere. Um, when I was coming back, I came back across Europe uh, to England through uh, Italy and Austria. And um, uh, he was aged in the photographs I took, particularly Wells Cathedral. I had a lovely photograph of the fan vaulting in, 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 in Wells Cathedral. He wasn't a teacher in the sense that he didn't, he wasn't really interested in teaching as such. Uh, he knew how to write, of course. Um, but I didn't learn that from him. Um, but he was a good tutor, really, he was a good influence. And I was just bursting to learn because, you know, it was, uh, coming to Oxford was just paradise by comparison with what had gone before. And, you know, I had freedom and all that. It was wonderful. Uh, so I was keen to get the utmost out of it all. And um, we had ha Cost in the president who taught us for for Voltaire's Letters, Lettres Philosophiques, did you do those? I, um, it was Wallished, I think, probably before you came, but and Topville, I think, was substituted. Topville, yes. um, so we did that with him, and Mabbott we had, the philosopher Mabbott, uh, for political thought, I think. <coughs> anyway, I did very well in prelims, and went in for the HWC Davis Prize, and came Proxime to uh, Priest Morgan, Mm. who got it, So both in St. John's. So St. Mm. John's was getting a reputation for history by that time. Didn't encounter Keith until I think the second year for the, quote, middle period. Um, and we didn't really get on. Um, I, I thought he ought to know that I was, I didn't need pushing, I, I knew what I was doing. And uh, he was very much a martinet and uh, um, I'd, I'd, I'd worked it out. You didn't have to do continuous British history. You could select and, and you could just focus on periods and you get through that way. So I refused to do anything on the 17th century, and, um, which was silly because he, he's the <laughs> 17th century person anyway. I didn't do anything on the 17th century and um, he, may, he forced me to, to do a collection. It was the only to do a, to write a few essays in that period. And it's the only time I ever borrowed somebody else's essay and copied it with a certain elegant variation. Um, and I wrote an essay on Cromwell about whom I knew nothing, um, but I got by. Uh, but I didn't like, I mean, he was, he was a martinet, really. Mm. And he, uh, for the best of all possible reasons, he wanted his pupils to do well. Mm. Um, he was very young, wasn't he? He was young, yes, yes. About 25. Or something. Yes, that's right. And hot from all souls. And um, so we didn't really get on. I mean, we didn't ever have a row exactly, but um, he certainly wasn't... Uh, um, he didn't wasn't, inspire you? 
No, not really. I, I respected his intelligence, of course, and the width of range. I mean, his lectures then were quite famous for political thought paper. Mm. You may have been to some. I went to them, yes. Um, and, and, you know, they really were very inspirational. I mean, as a lecturer, he was mm. awfully good. Mm. And anyway, the person who really inspired me among tutors was uh, Jill Lewis um, at St Anne's. Um, she taught me the Italian Renaissance, and um, she she just took an awful lot of trouble. You know, you you sent her an essay, and she scribble on it, and, mm. and she clearly had read it. Which I never really felt that any of my St John's tutors really read my essays did carefully. You, did you give them the essays, or didn't you just read them out to them? Well, I either read them out, or I gave them, but they never got extensive comment on them. Because the, the system I had with, just a little later, was you, you never handed in your essay. You always sat, read for 45 minutes, and then mm. about 10, quarter of an hour they would mm. make comments. I think it alternated with mm. us if we went mm. in pairs. You see, I was paired with, with either Cormac Rigby or Priest Morgan, as I mm. remember it, and one or other of us mm. read out the essay, uh, which would last 20 minutes. But my essays were always rather long, especially for Howard Cobbin, so I said to him at one stage, wouldn't it be sensible if I handed in my essay and you read it and we talked about it? <laughs> oh, that would mean that I'd have to give up my day in London if I did that, my research day. So I thought to myself, I'll never say that to a pupil of mine. If, I, if a pupil wants help from me, I'll, I'll never brush him off like that. Well, of course, I never was asked for that sort of service, but uh, in the end, I... Uh, I did do what I felt I shouldn't have done in the ideal world and allowed the one that was read out not to be commented on. I, initially I tried to comment on them all but I gave mm. up, it's just mm. impossible. Um, so I thought quite wrongly that my tutors were lazy. They weren't mm. lazy, they were just operating the Oxford system which only allowed a certain amount of time mm. and um, they couldn't have done really more than they did. Uh, Michael Hurst, who was a controversial character, of course, um, and eventually was disc pensioned off, in effect, by St. John's, who were rich enough to do it, because he had a row with a pupil, and I think it came to blows, I think. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, he treated me very well, and um, he was a good tutor. He was interested, seemed to be interested, encouraging. Um, <coughs> Paul Slack told me... Uh, <laughs> An episode in a tutorial with him where Michael said, um, now I think I'm being particularly original here, would you mind taking down what <laughs> I'm saying? <laughs> I'm <laughs> and that sort of conceit Michael suffered from and he was, in the end, I had to break with Michael because um, he took you over if you weren't careful. I mean, Michael, he wanted me to be a disciple and, and I was not a disciple and did not want to be. And uh, so in the end, that meant you had to break, otherwise mm. it would just not work. Uh, mm. Was well, he the 19th so century tutor? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, and he encouraged me in the 19th mm. and early 20th century, mm. I think. Uh, and as I say, he was a good tutor. Uh, it's a pity it had to end that way, but it had to end that mm. way. Uh, and um, he asked me at one stage, who, who, who do you think's the best historian or something? So I said, Hobsbawm. So he'd expected me to say Michael Hurst. Um, <laughs> uh, no go, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Were there any other lecturers? I mean, Isaiah Burley. Oh, yes, yes. Isaiah Burley, wonderful you. lectures. Mm. Oh, wonderful lectures on Marx and Marxism mm. and various other lecture series he went to, and they were wonderful. Mm. And they really were inspirational. Mm. And uh, I had a syndicate with um, Priest Morgan. Priest Morgan went to half a dozen that we both wanted to go to and I went to the other half dozen and we duplicated notes and gave them to each other <coughs> and we, you know, I learned a lot from Priest. Priest was a highly cultivated chap, uh, much more cultivated then and now than I am and um, he, uh, I envied him because he, his father was a professor of Welsh in, in a Welsh university and um, he just breathed it in, you know, mm. you know a very cultivated chap. Uh, Cormac didn't like him because Cormac thought he was a fraud. <laughs> mm. Cormac was very, very demanding of people. And um, 
Beast was a great actor. Is Cormac going to be very happy with hearing all this? Or Big Bon? Is Cormac going to be happy to hear all this? Or um, We'll decide that later. <laughs> I think, I mean, Cormac knew where I stood on things, uh, but he thought I was, I think he rightly thought I was a bit over whelmed with Priest Morgan really mm. I mean, that, I, that Priest was more of a fraud mm. than I realised mm. I think um, but anyway I learned a lot from Priest um, and um, in general we had a good group of people there and uh, in the second year I won the Gibbs scholarship which was a godsend because that gave me £300 a year for three years and um, that was a lot of money in those days and that started this off Mm, and I wrote mm -hmm. to Keith and said, you know, where do you get your books from? And he said, well, the thing is to give your name to a number of booksellers and they send you catalogues and then you order things from their catalogues. And I did that for an awful long time, which involved a huge amount of work working through these catalogues and you must have done mm. the same. And also expeditions to Ilfracoon and places like that. Where hey on why did you go? Hey on why I did go once and was rather disappointed because mm. they don't have many interesting books there. Oh, they mm. didn't then. But, you know, Ilfracombe, the cinema bookshop at Ilfracombe was a mm. gold mine. Mm. And they were usually in cathedral cities, these, mm. these places. And all my Victorian biographies and my bishops came from there. Um, and it was Keith, uh, at that point, Keith came into his own in my life, really, because Keith, uh, when I won the Gibbs Scholarship, which I think Keith had won, yes. mm. um, he realised that whatever he thought of me, uh, there was something there. <laughs> 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 and um, uh, he was very encouraging to me as a graduate student uh, and I was flattered you know, to be written to by my tutor in his own hand I mean you know, he had no responsibility for me at all uh, uh, my supervisor was Peter Mathias mm. but nonetheless he gave me every encouragement as you know and um, you know, I still have, feel a great feeling of obligation he's a model of what I might call aftercare. I mean, um, he wasn't the man for me as an undergraduate, but as soon as I became a graduate student, he couldn't have been more helpful. And um, so he used to suggest books and things to read and uh, got me started on buying books and uh, invited me to meals sometimes at his house and uh, in every way it was encouraging. So he and uh, Michael Hurst didn't get on really. Um, Michael Hurst was jealous of his influence and his, his rising fast then. Uh, so that was incompatible also with my liaison or my relationship with, with Michael. 